the target value. So, so this is an idea and it suggests that maybe there's this non-monotonic behavior um, sorry this non-monotonic behavior up down up which is interesting because it's very uncommon in congestion systems so the analysis is a two-level Markov model the equations are in the paper uh, there's a transient Markov chain over each control interval uh, which has uh, is uh, it's a term it's a discrete time submodel which runs over k subset of a smaller size so let's say 100 steps of size uh, delta over 100 and the initial state is any value the state of the queue and at substep k we follow two numbers the, the number in the queue with the arrivals and departures and the accumulated count of busy substeps which gives us the utilization at the at the end or the probability of a given utilization so at the end we have an estimate for the transient of b of k over k for each possible state uh, which is the number of counts over the number of substeps and this probability at the end of the delta the end of the interval this delta interval gives us the transition probability to the next for the next this initial state of the next interval the high level markov chain is embedded only at the control intervals and the, the transition probabilities are from the number in q to a, a new number in q at the end of the next interval and the next speed factor which may be the same maybe one more or one less depending on b on the probability that b is above or below the target and this was solved for a single target value rather than for plus and minus target values well the numerical results uh, depend on the length of the of the uh, estimation interval in terms of the mean services uh, the experiment set the service rate to one and so the delta the value of the service uh, of the inter estimation interval is simply the value of this parameter and the shortest value I looked at was delta equals one the same as the service time the service rate and basically it follows the maximum speed curve it spends very little time waiting to transition to maximum speed once it gets a, a, a job coming in however when you get a larger value like 30 we see a very interesting thing we see that the, the utilization curve let's take the utilization curve for the target utilization 0.9 it makes a smooth transition from the low speed to the high speed and over this intermediate range of, of target utilizations around target utilization 0 0.5 0 0.6 it has a large long region of level constant response time is very nice and this is what the speed control is really looking for however when the interval is longer we get something quite different we get we follow the slow curve for much uh, for, further up the curve to much longer response times and then we have a descending uh, interval at heavier loads where the response time actually gets shorter as the load gets heavier very unusual and then we hit the high speed uh, limit and we have to follow the high speed curve up so so this is a really the interesting behavior when the interval estimation interval is long and the reason for this is that we get we switch to a low speed and we stay there for a long time and our rivals come in and, and the queue builds and we get long queues and bad response times for quite a while until we estimate again and say oh we've got to speed up and then we only speed up one step at a time so it can take some time before we we get uh, the the uh, the speed up and we get this uh, long uh, res large response times as a result of that so this is a zigzag shape i called it um, it is that has this descending interval here so two problems with this this is for a curve that wasn't shown in the previous graph this is for 100 between the 30 and the 300 there's a sweet spot here which is the 
uh, near to maximum utilization and relatively low response time compared to others near it but it's very narrow and if you in this sweet spot it doesn't take much of a load increase or, or much of a service time increase uh, for the uh, response to collapse very rapidly so you get sort of unstable behavior and then this negative slope a lot of load management algorithms assume that response time the performance improves when load is reduced and here we have that we can reduce the load and the response time will increase and we reduce it again and it increases more and this could confuse a load management algorithm in particular it might get stuck down here where it, it's increasing the load and it can't get over this hump um, it, it so it, it keeps the response time down it stays here rather than jumping over to here where it could get a whole lot more computing done uh, at a higher speed uh, and more economically actually so other questions about this algorithm it's supposed to control the utilization however it doesn't control it very well at the, the value of 30 for this uh, parameter 30 30 service times um, there really isn't any place where the control is 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 proper if we set u equal to 0 0.3 it just doesn't manage it 0.3 is down here and it, it can't hold it down there if we set u equal to 0.9 it, it, it can't do much either um, I think these are upside down um this should be 0.9 and this should be 0.3 uh if we have 100 it's better now we can see that we have a little bit of control and this is more or less at the level uh, 0.6 which is the value of the target for this particular curve going up here and if we go to 300 we get quite reasonable control over an interval of loads but not a very big interval in, in the case of setting the target utilization to 0.6 we can only control it well below a load of 0.6 which is fair but only above a load of about 0.3 so okay we 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 can't expect to uh, uh, do better than that um, but we shouldn't expect that the utilization control is all that effective and uh, the power effectiveness is also interesting this is the, the, the there are curves in the paper for all the different values uh, from 1 to 300 of this uh, length of the estimation interval for 30 um, the upper line is the mean power of the uh, expanded by the um, performance algorithm and the dotted lines are the mean power expended by the the conservative governor at different arrival rates and target utilizations and they're pretty close together over the target utilizations but the higher you make the target utilization the slower the processor runs and the more power you save uh, so uh, we can get down to this lower curve which at 20% load is a big saving 50% saving in power if the load on the processor is light the load on the processor is at 40% we have a rather much less saving um, we have about from between the uh, the uh, performance governor and the and the conservative governor the saving depends on the target utilization it ranges from uh, eight percent to to thirty uh, percent in this graph eight percent if you set the utilization low because then it tries to keep the processor running fast and better thirty uh, percent but only thirty percent so that's what we can gain and the the heavier the load gets on the processor the less opportunity there is to save so up at this area here the saving is just a few percent so there isn't that much room for this algorithm to save a lot of power if the processors are already running fast and that's not surprising now we have this model which is fairly complicated and really not practical for computing response times can we find a way to compute 
simpler approximations well here's one that's not terribly good I called it the perfect knowledge approximation because it, it assumes a target a single target uh, and it looks it follows that intuitive notion that, that we follow the low speed response curve up to the point where we hit the target utilization and then we hold the utilization constant while we increase while the load increases so for higher loads we keep the utilization constant and vary the speed up to a point where we hit the maximum speed and at that point we can't do anything about utilization we follow the the the, the high speed curve up here so we, we follow the ABCD curve and it for for, for, <clears throat> for low values uh, from low and moderate values of of the delta the the uh, averaging value this overstates the zigzag for large values of delta it may understate the zigzag the, the degree of, of this uh, jump uh, so it, it's uh, it, it's not exactly the same as the uh, what we actually get but it gives a notion um, a better approximation for bear in mind that the useful the use a second approximation is <clears throat> somewhat better uh, and more useful for small values of the uh, um, averaging interval and lowish values of the target utilization so the areas where we get good behavior of the conservative governor this is a reasonable approximation it places a straight uh, uh, level line between the two speed levels uh, from b to c uh, the low speed uh, lowest speed and highest speed and it places it halfway between the lowest response time and the peak of the pk approximation so it's sort of in the middle of the behavior in that area and the values found by the Markov analysis are shown by the dotted lines for different values of the averaging interval. Um, in this example, the, the uh, um, target utilization is 0.5, and the averaging, and the approximation is really not too far off. The paper gives some figures for the error. Uh, so this is the plateau approximation. So overall, we can conclude the Markov model is interesting but complicated. But there are simpler approximations, and the plateau approximation could be used for situations where we want fairly good response time, and, and we can control the averaging interval to be not too large. The conservative governance saves some energy compared to the performance governor. Not as much as we might like. The desirable flat response curve can only be obtained for moderate values of this, but this depends on knowing the surface time. And it's not easy to know that. So it's not easy to control the value of delta mu. And, and, and the actual value of delta used in, in Linux is the uh, the tick the 10 millisecond tick which is way too long so the Linux we would expect the Linux conservative governor is well into the large delta behavior a and the windows I've experimented with the windows uh, power saving governor it gives terrible performance um, very uh, bad behavior like this um, uh, consistent with the, the, the diagram for large filter mu. And finally there's a concern that adaptive scaling strategies like um, uh, horizontal scaling uh, often work from utilizations and they assume that uh, you divide the load down you get better performance and it may not happen with speed control maybe a little different from what's expected so where can this go we'd like to improve the power saving over the performance cover and we'd like to avoid these problems to save more power we still have to run at less than full speed when there's work to do so I have to know something and the, estimating the utilization is not wonderful in terms of its a, a, a method for doing this the other way might be if we knew more 
And we know from results on optimal scheduling that we, if we know the job demands, if we have, if we know the importance of early completion for jobs, we can do better at scheduling them. So one possibility is the no, old notion of background jobs uh, as a less urgent and uh, give them, uh, the, the, <clears throat> let the speed depend on how many background jobs are running as a proportion or how many of the non-background jobs are running and let it depend on that rather than on the background jobs. And just because a job is long running doesn't mean it's not urgent. So de trying to detect non-urgent jobs just by looking at how long they've run, which is a, 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 ske a scheduling strategy that is used, is not a great idea for speed control. Anyway, time for questions. Okay, so thank you for your presentation. We have one question from the audience who asked to compare this type of speed scaling mechanism to the one that are based on the length of the queue, which... Uh... Okay, I I'm unmuted, I take it. You you're hearing me? Yes. Um, so the, the the state of the system is, is, is given by the length of the queue and it's uh, for a, uh, an, an analytic optimization, uh, the state of the queue is, is the right way to go. Uh, the, the problem is that from the, from the point of view of, of users of the set, what, what are you going to optimize? You, if you go to minimize the average response time, this will not necessarily, not necessarily deal properly with, with the jobs you've got on the computer. For example, if you got a single batch job running on your computer, uh, the, the queue is short and, and the processor might slow way down and uh, this would not be a particularly helpful approach to speed control from the point of view of the user. So uh, I think that there's a question of, of overall goals um, that have to be for comparing, for doing that comparison. I haven't tackled that uh, sufficiently systematically to, to give a, uh, you, you a good answer, Andrea. Um, but the, the, the solution, I mean, the, the control is quite different. I mean, the performance governor, the, which is the one that everybody uses really if they want their system to work, is based on the queue length. The queue length is one or more, run at maximum speed. If it's zero, run at minimum speed. That's very logical, uh, uh, simple, simple-minded uh, state-based uh, governor. So I, you know, I, I think, uh, I think the problem would be tuning it to do the right thing for practical workloads. Do we have any others? Oh, so Marco, I'm not hearing you. You're muted, Marco. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Uh, my, my question is that this type of uh, mechanism are um, transient by nature. So do you expect to have very different results when, for example, you imagine that the input is some sort of Markov modulated Poisson process where, for example, the modulating process stays in one of the modulating state for time larger than the delta choose by the algorithm? You mean the, the same kind of response time curve? Uh, well, consider that the, the, you have it's like bursty arrivals. You have arrival rate, which goes high and then low. This is the kind of thing you need, is that, is that right? So uh, you would move back and the, I mean, the curve covers, if you think of, of moving steady state as a first approximation to that, the, you, you could move from the left-hand side of that curve to the right and the response time would follow this uh, strange behavior interacting with the controller as, as it goes. Uh, that's what I was thinking of. And I talked about being trapped in one uh, side of the curve where you really want to be on the other side. Uh, this is where state-based control might do better, uh, I think. And, and that, that could be a good basis of comparison. Rather than looking at a, a really constant regime, look at a, a time-varying regime, and the state-based control may provide a more robust measure. Robust approach. Okay, 
So thank you so much. I see no other questions. So to keep timing, I will move to the next uh, presentation, which should be done by um, Ruan Wang for the service demand distribution estimation for microservice using Markovian arrival processes. And she is a PhD student at the Imperial College under the supervision of Giuliano Casale. So please, uh, Ronan, you can uh, uh, run the presentation and then we will see some questions. Welcome to our presentation to service demand distribution estimation for microservices using Markov arrival processes. I'm today's presenter, Runan, from Imperial College London. So let's start with brief introduction. Um, performance models can help to describe the system with a simplified representation. Um, this is quite important, especially in DevOps context, um, since it enables simulation and forecasting for uh, both uh, developers and operators. So um, a series of what-if analysis can be done with performance or models too. Um, to build performance models for microservice application, um, it is important to consider both architectural and, and analytical models. Tosca modeling provide, um, provide us a direct topological description of application. And um, to enable simulation, we also need to transfer the Tosca model into analytical model like QE networks. Um, which can be solved with analytical solver via simulation. However, um, there is a challenging part uh, for the performance model parameterization. Um, because an um, accurate service demand estimation is one of the um, critical parameters for performance models, which will directly uh, impact the uh, predictive accuracy. Um, classical approaches based on linear regression um, mainly focus on estimating the mean values and characterize the service demand with exponential distribution. Um, however, this kind of um, restricting attention to the mean can limit the accuracy of uh, prediction. So here is a motivating example. Um, in this figure, um, the, it is the CDF of um, response time from uh, uh, tree, uh, real trees and simulation. So uh, for the simulation, the service demand is exponentially distributed with the same mean um, as the trees. So if we look at like the 95th percentile used for service level agreements, there, we can see that there is an inaccurate prediction for the response time. Um, so this kind of issue um, uh, can uh, um, affect the critical metrics, such as higher percentiles of the response time. So um, to, uh, to address this uh, limitation, uh, we try to capture the higher moments of the service demand distribution. Uh, next, I will give a very brief preliminaries of this work. Um, uh, as we know, acyclic um, phase step distributions and the Markovian arrival processes are quite uh, well known and widely used. So briefly speaking, the acyclic uh, uh, phase step distributions uh, oh, is a subset of phase step distribution with a cyclic underlying Markov chain, which means that um, there should um, uh, has at least one um, Markov representation without any circle. Um, and uh, for the maps, um, um, maps are able to incorporate correlations between interval times and can be represented with the D0 and D1 metrics 
um, as we all know. So in our work, the service demand distribution is modeled with APH. So the parameters of APH, uh, I mean the alpha and T, uh, can be obtained with various uh, pH distribution fitting method like uh, moment, fitting, fit, mo moment matching. Uh, however, the method can uh, this method uh, can be extended to an arbitrary numbers of moments. So in this work, we consider using the first three moments um, to study the phase and the acyclic phase tip distribution for service demand. Um, we attempt to involve the third moment. It's because its characterization on the uh, fitting performance of the end in the tail. So um, the service demand distribution can be described as the function of the first three moments with parameters um, eta, uh, c square, and sk. So here are some notations for service demand distribution modeling. Suppose um, we have the interdepartial times, and based on the departure map, um, the joint uh, probability density function can be calculated based the following equation. Um, here is an overview of our methodology. So after we deploy a microservice um, application, we can monitor the system and collect the uh, measured traces. Then we can represent a microservice as a closed system, queuing system, uh, with finite population, and in which the service demand is characterized with APH, and the departure process um, is ext extracted as a departure map. So the problem of the uh, resource demand estimation is formulated as an optimization problem. So here we try to uh, use two different um, method here to solve the problem. The first one is the global optimization and the other is the heuristics based estimation. We aim to infer the service demand distribution that maximize the likelihood of the collected, collected trace data with departure map. Um, however, um, um, when we when we perform global searching or heuristic based estimation, with the increasing of the number uh, of users, um, if we solve the, the, the queuing model with, uh, um, with uh, analyzing the uh, CTMC, the state space can easily suffer explosion. So um, considering that if the server follows a processor sharing schedule um, uh, strategy um, and uh, the service is APH distributed, so the number of states in the space can uh, easily go extremely large. Um, this is due to the combinations of drop allocation to APH phases. Mm, to mitigate the um, complexity of dealing with PS scheduling, we propose to capture the um, mean behavior of the original model to reduce the number of users uh, so that avoid the CMC explosion. Uh, we focus on the mean Q length that can be approximated using mean value analysis. So in the following equation, there are on average um, QN customers when there are N total customers in the system. So the N prime is the expect number observed at the uh, arrival. So now instead of consider all the individual jobs circulating in the delay at the queue, this simplified model assumes that there are n prime uh, permanent customers perpetually loops at the queue. Um, this is the overview of the global optimization based estimation. So the algorithm first generates a set of moments that satisfies the bound constraints, and then it fit for uh, APH distribution. Um, after obtaining the APH distribution for the service demand, 
a QE model can be generated. Uh, and then um, to construct the departure map, uh, we need to first solve the um, QE model by analyzing the underlying Markov um, CTMC uh, to get the infinitesimal generator Q. And by analyzing the transitions in Q, we can filter V0 and V1 uh, from Q to uh, generate the departure map. And then we can, uh, and then we can calculate the maximum likelihood value based on the interdeparture times from the monitoring data, and the algorithm will iterate until it converges. Uh, however, the global optimization method for service demand distribution uh, estimation um, needs to consider a large search range. So um, it could be time consuming to obtain the opti um, to obtain the optimal site with um, a maximum value in the execution. Um, so um, we present another method that um, estimates the parameters sequentially, um, which offers an heuristics uh, estimation that um, trace the accuracy for the speed. So uh, it will divide the problem into three sub-problems of fitting moments by using a collection of estimation methods. Um, here, um, in the heuristic-based estimation, um, we have the input um, as uh, the response times from the mirror decrease and also the Q latency upon arrivals. Um, the mean value of the service demand can be estimated um, based on performance measurements from monitoring traces. So we refer to um, the, the estimation of the expected values uh, with Q length and response times. Um, to um, estimate the second moments of the service demand, uh, we consider to investigate the state-dependent behavior of the system. Um, uh, the estimation formula is derived from the SV uh, upon the uh, mean Q length seen upon arrivals. So we proposed to estimate the c square using the following heuristics expression. Um, here is the um, overview of the heuristics based estimation. So the, the mean um, service demand and the SV uh, can be estimated as we illustrated. And then um, for our algorithm, and the only um, searching parameters is the skewness for the third moment. Um, so um, we generate a set of candidates skewness there. And for each skewness uh, candidate, we generate a queuing model with a pH distribution fit from the first three moments. And then we uh, also need to solve the um, queuing model um, by analyzing the CTMC and uh, filter the infinitesimal generator and construct the departure map. Um, and the, the algorithm will then uh, calculate the maximum likelihood value uh, with the interdeparture times. And the algorithm will search all the, search on all the candidates in the um, set. So the estimated result of the um, skewness is finally decided on the um, max likelihood value. Um, to evaluate the proposed service demand um, distribution uh, estimation method, uh, we conduct um, ex uh, several experiments and compare the result to our baseline algorithm. So uh, we um, in the experiment, we deployed a microservice-based um, application called SockShop. So we selected one of the microservices in SockShop. The closed workload is um, G2 
generated with locus. And, um, and we can see that the details of the setting uh, of populations can be seen in this um, table. Our baseline algorithm is uh, the classical exponentially distributed service uh, demand and to evaluate the uh, uh, fitting performance of the uh, estimation, we consider the, to use the following metrics. So we use um, the response time distribution from both um, real trees and the simulation results. And we try to plot the CCDF of the um, response time to compare the result. Uh, first, um, here is our um, experimental result for different number of users with FCFS strategy. For a single server system with FCFS, um, the service time can be obtained from sampling inter-departure times when the server is not idle. So uh, for FCFS, we can directly calculate the first three moments from these samples. So we defined another curve called FCFS single here um, in the comparison. It can be seen that uh, uh, in the figure that all three different uh, number of users um, um, uh, our method has a good fit compared to the baseline algorithm. Um, we can see that uh, from the body fitting, both baseline and our proposed um, fitting method yield good performance. And um, our however, our, mod um, our model achieves a better um, a fit for the end in the tail which is quite important to evaluate the um, uh, performance of the system. Um, and we can observe that our estimated um, distribution show better uh, fit throughout the whole distribution, which is quite close to the real trees um, distribution. And also we, anal uh, we analysis uh, with uh, PS. So we can see from the figure that switching from FCFS to PS um, impact the result of the baseline in uh, a um, significant manner. So uh, first, um, we can see that um, our method fits the body of the distribution and achieves a slower decay for the tail. However, if we look at the baseline, uh, uh, if we look at the baseline algorithm, we can see that um, it first fits while at the beginning and it decays faster from the middle and not able to capture the tail. Um, while for low and medium CPU utilization, uh, our method outperforms the baseline, especially for the tail. However, if we uh, look at a case with um, a very high CPU utilization, which is close to uh, 100%, um, the baseline method achieves a closer fit to the uh, data with PS. Um, so um, after the comparison, after comparison the re of the result with FCFS and PS, um, we can summarize that in reality, um, the actual system scheduling will um, impact in different uh, elements like um, caching, uh, uh, memory bandwidth, and also the operating system schedule. So um, um, it cannot be neither it can uh, be neither perfectly uh, perfect sharing or no FCFS. Uh, therefore, um, our results indicate that other models provide a reasonable approximation to the observed system behavior, um, but um, FCFS seems appear more suitable to the model, uh, to model the heavy load. Uh, so the previous results indicate that in majority of the um, uh, majority cases, the proposed method is able to fit the uh, service of the microservice with high 
fidelity than the exponential models. Um, in conclusion, uh, we first uh, characterized the service demand of the Q node with APH distribution, and also we um, construct a departure map uh, for the Q node, uh, and we perform um, a global search and another heuristics-based method to scale up the optimization problem we're trying to solve, and we achieve a better uh, performance on fitting real traces of microservices. Um, so uh, that's all, thank you, and any questions? Okay, so thank you for the presentation. There are no questions yet on the um, chat on the question and answer, so please use it. Oh, Nurei has a question, so please go live. So I, I, I found I couldn't type into the Q&A window. Uh, sorry, Mark, I, I don't know how that works. Um, but two moments are relatively straightforward compared to three. Mm -hmm. uh, how much extra value do you get from the third moment over doing what you did for just two moments? Um, because uh, why we consider the third moment is because um, we found that um, involving third moment can significantly improve the performance of the tail. Because with the third moment, we um, actually in, in the paper, we use the skillness to capture the third moment. We can see that um, it, it characterized the tail very well compared to the uh, only used two moments. So actually maybe it cost our some like some execution time to obtain the third moments, but uh, we can see a great improve of the, especially on the tail from the middle to the tail actually. So you, you you did try the the method on two moments. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the, yeah. Actually, two moments. Estimation. Yeah, two moments is actually uh, like a motivating um, example in, um, uh, the, uh, on this paper. Yeah. So we first tried two moments because there are plenty of uh, estimation based on the two moments to get the service demand. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, Thank I you. don't see other questions, so I will go with the short question for me. So, uh, and the question is, uh, why microservice? Because uh, it seems that um, you are fitting a closed model and trying to estimate the service time from the response time that you have measured, mm -hmm. which I guess is for every closed system and not just for microservices. So why microservices? Yeah, so um, so I think that's a good question. So this is uh, maybe our like some background uh, of this research work because we first found that in DevOps context, microservices and also the serverless, fun serverless function are widely used. And uh, uh, maybe we, we are trying to model how, uh, consider how can we model a microservice and how can we get the prediction of the microservice uh, prediction performance of the of, of a microservice, especially in this um, DevOps context. So we think that we can capture a microservice with a um, with a well known like everybody knows the closed model to model this system, and then we can solve this um, uh, a prediction of the microservice based on this uh, closed uh, queue. I mean. So I think maybe this is our background of this research work and why we're trying to uh, find some model for, especially for microservice. Okay, so thank you so much. If there are no other questions, I will move on. So we will be a little bit more on schedule. And thank you. Thank you so much. And the next paper will be presented by Gregory Kielanski, sorry for not pronouncing correctly your name, which is performance analysis of work stealing strategy in dark scale multi traded computing, which also yesterday was awarded with the best paper of guest this year. So thank you, Gregory. Let's go on with your presentation and please use the question and answer or raise the hand as Murray did uh, at the end of the presentation. Thank you.
and I will give a short presentation on the paper titled Performance Analysis of Work Steering Strategies in Large-Scale Multi-Threaded Computing. This is joint work with my PhD advisor, Benny Van Hout. In this paper, we focus on a class of large-scale multi-threaded systems with work steering. Work steering is a scheme to redistribute the workload among different queues. It has been implemented in, for example, Intel PDB and the Java Ford Joint Framework. There also exists a concept of work sharing. The difference between work stealing and work sharing is that in work stealing, empty queues prompt other queues to try to take over some of the work if the probe queue is busy. While in work sharing, busy queues try to find empty queues to offload some of their work. In other words, the difference lies in which queue initiates the probing. It has been shown that in general, work stealing performs better than work sharing for systems with high load. The key difference between our paper and most of the previous work lies in the fact that prior research focused on systems where whole jobs are considered to be sequential and are always executed as a whole on a single server. In our case, parts of a job can be executed by different queues in parallel. Our multi-threaded system consists of n homogeneous queues, each with first-in, first-out service and an infinite buffer. We distinguish between main threads, which we'll call parent jobs or simply parents, and other threads, which we'll call child jobs or simply children. In our example, the parents and children are represented by blue and orange filled circles, respectively. In the example, the system consists of four queues. Parent jobs arrive at each queue according to a local Poisson process with arrival rate lambda. In the example, the fourth queue gets a parent job, which it stores in the buffer. Once a new parent job enters service, it spawns a number of child jobs. The number of child jobs spawned follows a general distribution with finite support. These spawned uh, children are initially stored at the front of the buffer of the queue. In the example, in the, in the second queue, a parent finishes service, making the next parent enter service and spawn three children. The parent and child jobs have exponentially distributed service requirements with parameters mu1 and mu2 respectively. We say that a job finishes service when a parent and all of its children have finished service. Empty queues generate steal attempts at a rate r and probe other queues at random. If there are pending parent or child jobs in a probe queue, the steal attempt is successful. Otherwise, the steal attempt fails. If there are pending child jobs in the probe queue, a number of these children is transferred following a general distribution. In the example, the first queue tries to steal from the second one. Uh, there are three child jobs pending in the second queue, and the first two of them get transferred. The first of these transferred jobs then proceeds into service in the new queue. Note that the pending child job in the first queue can further be stolen by a different queue. When a steal attempt is successful and there are only Pending parent jobs in the probe queue, the first pending parent gets transferred and immediately enters service in the probing queue, which makes it spawn several children. In our example, the third queue steals a parent from the fourth, and this parent spawns two child jobs in the probing queue. I will now introduce some notation. Suppose a steal attempt is successful and there are pending child jobs in the probe queue. We denote by Psi ij the probability that out of i waiting child jobs, j gets stolen if a child is in service in the probe queue. Similarly, we denote by Phi ij the probability that out of i waiting child jobs, j gets stolen if a parent is in service in the probe queue. Note that these Psi's and Phi's fully characterize the stealing strategy used in the system. The main objective of the paper is to study the influence of the stealing probabilities psi ij and phi ij 
from the mean response time of the system using analytical methods. To be completely clear, when a certain number of pending trial drops is present in a queue, the field probability can be different depending on whether a parent or a child is in service. There are two reasons why we make this distinction. First, it doesn't complicate the analysis, and second, it is possible that a good skimming strategy has different skimming probabilities depending on whether or not a parent is in service. For example, suppose we have a system where parent jobs take a long time to process while child jobs get processed quickly. Suppose further that the arrival rate lambda is small, such that the chance that there exist pending parent jobs in this system is small. Then, one can expect that the following is a good skimming strategy. If a parent is in service in the probe queue, skew most or all of the child jobs, uh, since it will probably take a long time before the parent exits service. If there is, however, a child job in service, skew half of the pending children. So, what are the main contributions of the paper? Well, the system of n queues is a market chain but is too complex to study exactly. We therefore introduced a quasi birth dead market chain, QBD for short, describing a single server queuing system. This QBD is used to approximate the performance of the work skewing system of n queues. We present simulation results that suggest that as the number of servers becomes large, the approximation error tends to zero. We prove that this QBD has a unique stationary distribution for which we provide formulas for the waiting, service, mean waiting, and mean service time. These are the main technical results of the paper. Finally, we compare the performance of several skewing strategies. It's easy to see that the QBD market chain has a negative arrival when there are pending jobs in the queue. This corresponds to the jobs being stolen from the queue. Further, the arrival rate of jobs when the queue is empty is higher than lambda. This is due to stolen jobs being transferred to the queue. The first step we did was we found explicit formulas corresponding to these skew events. Thanks to this, we didn't need to use any iterative methods for the analysis. We've proven that when rho, the load of the system, is smaller than 1, the QBD process is positive recurrent. Note that the load of the system can be expressed as the arrival rate times the average amount of work carried, carried by a parent. That is, the amount of work for the parent job plus the average amount of children spawned by the parent times the amount of work per child job. We've shown that the unique stationary distribution of this QBD can be easily calculated numerically, where the most computationally, computationally demanding step is solving a quadratic matrix equation. As previously noted, the system of NQs is too complex to be studied exactly. Therefore, we use the QBD approximation and validate the system using simulation. Here, we present four of the many settings which we simulated. Clearly, the relative error tends to zero as n increases. Further, the simulated uh, mean response time seems to be O1 over n accurate in agreement with known results. To add further support, that the approximation of the system becomes exact as uh, the number of queues becomes large, I will shortly comment on some results omitted from the paper due to the limit on the number of pages. We've developed a mean field model whose evolution is captured by a set of ordinary differential equations. We've shown that every fixed point of this set of ODEs corresponds to the unique stationary distribution of the QBD Markov chain, hence the set of ODEs has a unique fixed point given by the stationary distribution. Obviously, this doesn't prove that the stochastic system converges to the mean field model. The difficulty lies in proving the global attraction as the system exhibits no apparent monotonicity. 
we describe the response time distribution uh, as the sum of waiting and service time distributions and study each of those separately. The waiting time distribution and the mean waiting time can be described similarly to the ones in the paper titled Sojourn uh, Time Distributions in the Queue Defined by a General QDD Process uh, by Ozawa. Finding formulas for the service time is more tricky, as jobs can be stolen multiple times. This can happen in two ways. For example, a stolen child job from a batch of stolen children can be stolen further, or, that's the second uh, way, a parent gets stolen as some of its own children get stolen further. This results in the need to use nested integrals to describe the service time distribution. This is not desirable from the numerical point of view. Luckily, we found a way to describe the mean uh, service time without integrals, but with a simple recursive formula. Once we found a formula for the mean response time, we were able to compare different stealing strategies. We mainly wanted to compare the strategies of always stealing a single child, always stealing half of dependent children, and of always stealing all of dependent children against the best so-called monotone deterministic strategy. Now, what do we mean by monotone deterministic? First, by deterministic we mean that every probability psi ij is either 0 or 1, and similarly, every probability phi ij is either 0 or 1. In other words, for a given number of available child jobs, the same amount of child jobs is stolen every time. Second, if we steal j out of i child jobs, uh, then we are required to steal j or more child jobs if there are uh, more than i pending child jobs. The best monotone deterministic strategy can be then de determined by brute force. There is, however, one problem. Uh, let m denote the maximum number of children that can be spawned by a single parent. Then, the number of monotone deterministic strategies is equal to the n Catalan number times the n plus 1 Catalan number. Uh, this means that the number of monotone deterministic strategies grows very quickly in function of n. This also means that it can take a very long time to determine the optimal monotone deterministic strategy for larger values of n. We therefore introduce a family of strategies which we call bound monotone deterministic strategies. These form a subset of monotone deterministic strategies with the following extra requirements. If we steal j out of i children, then we are required to steal either j or j plus 1 out of i plus 1 children. There are 2 to the power n minus 2 times 2 to the power n minus 1 bounded monotone deterministic strategies for a given m greater than 1. This number grows much slower than the number of monotone deterministic strategies. Therefore, takes way less time to find optimal bounded monotone deterministic strategy than optimal monotone deterministic strategy. Obviously, it's possible that an optimal monotone deterministic strategy differs from the optimal bounded monotone deterministic strategy. In fact, for uh, values of m greater than or equal to 6, we have found examples where this is the case. However, the difference in mean response time between the two strategies was negligible in all such examples. Then, by using the optimal bounded monotone deterministic strategy as a benchmark, we found the following. As one can expect, there exists no universal optimal strategy. However, out of the three aforementioned strategies, the strategy of stealing a single child usually performs the worst. The stealing policy where half of child jobs get stolen every time is in general a good stealing policy for a higher steal rate. In fact, in many cases it performs as well as the optimal bounded monotone deterministic strategy. This can be expected as the children 
then get uh, redistributed well among other servants, making the jobs finish quicker. We further concluded that the strategy of skilling all children performs best for low skill rates. In fact, for high arrival rates and low skill rates, it is the best bounded monotone deterministic strategy. Intuitively, the reason for this is uh, the system should offload as much work as possible to empty servers per steel, since the steel rate is low and the arrival rate is high. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you so much for the presentation. I don't see any question in the question uh, page, not on the chat. So I'm going to make you a small clarification question. So uh, you talk about uh, response time. And uh, when you have this sort of uh, work stealing, I am a bit confused on what the response time actually is. Can you clarify a little bit? Yeah, so uh, it's the time between uh, the arrival of a parent to a queue and uh, the time when, uh, when all of the children of the parent and the parent finish the service. Regardless yeah, so of the queue where they are served, right? So, sorry, uh, regardless of the queue where they are served. So, it yeah. might happen yeah. that one of the children in another queue ends after yes. the, um, the parent. Okay. Yes, and since there are no other questions, I will just make a second one. So, you start with some uh, uh, example, high level example of um, system which might have this type of work stealing behavior. Uh, those examples were still quite general. Do you have some more specific system in mind or are you still on a very broad range of possible application? Well, I didn't have any uh... A specific system in mind. I just noticed that, uh, as I said in the introduction, uh, all the papers I could find uh, talked specifically about uh, jobs uh, as a whole, right? So you execute them on a single server. If there are works, if there is work stealing or, or work sharing, you transfer the whole job. And I just thought to myself, I wonder what happens if uh, if you steal parts of a job, and from there, uh, you know, I finished at you know, these different uh, stealing strategies. So, yeah, because by reading this, a possible application that for me came to mind is uh, rendering for video or 3D images, where in general the images is split into blocks. So you have one initial step where you do some sort of preprocessing to create some buffer that then are needed by all the application. Then the image is segmented and the image will be finished when all the segments are finished. So probably that could be a real example where um, work speeding could uh, improve the rendering if you have a render farm with a lot of uh, rendering server and might uh, follow your uh, model. Yeah. Okay, so if there are no other questions, uh, thank you for the speaker. We have been able to be to finish on time. Also, even if we had some small delay in the beginning. So, thank you so much. Now, there will be, if I remember correctly, one small break, and then there will be the keynote of formats. And as far as I understand, the cast will continue in one hour and 45 minutes at around five for the next session. So, thank you, everybody. Thanks, the speaker again. And uh, let's see you later with the following session. Bye. Thank you. Bye.